So we're excited now to get into our keynote address to open our program. And we're very happy to have with us today, Takis Georgiakopoulos, who is the global head of wholesale payments at JP Morgan. Takis, welcome. Thank you, Todd, and thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. Not many people can do that. Uh, and thanks to BAFT for organizing this year's virtual conference. Even though virtual is not ideal, I think it's even more important these days for our industry to keep the dialogue going, even if we can't meet in person. Um, we are pleased to participate on the BAFT board, uh, Payments and Trade Council, uh, as well as several of the regional councils. And, and I want to acknowledge some of the great work that uh, BAFT has done uh, most recently, the work that you guys did on um, payables finance, uh, the accounting standards on payables finance, um, uh, uh, accounting standards or compensation standards for back value payments, as well as the, the work that you've done on education efforts for uh, new joiners in the industry. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and thank I'm you. looking forward to the output of uh, uh, of this year's conference and uh, what we can all do to collectively improve our industry. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your support. And I think you started off with, with recognizing the importance of <laughs> virtual and the importance of digital and something even prior to the pandemic one of the things that we had heard that really dominated the conversation about transaction banking was the shift to, to digital and the innovation that was taking place in the space. So maybe we can start with the future of finance. Can you share with us, tell us in your view, how the transaction services agenda has changed as a function of the global pandemic? And, and what are the things that surprised you? So let me start with uh, the one thing that surprised me on the positive side. We, we all do scenario planning and we all think about contingencies and recovery and uh, stress events, et cetera. I don't think any one of us would have thought a world in which literally overnight you go to people working from home, the whole world basically shutting down and nothing happens. The whole industry continue to work the resiliency of our systems, our processes, our people across the whole industry worked just extraordinarily well. So I think that is just a, a collective congratulations to everyone that worked to make that happen. Uh, that to me was kind of a very positive surprise, which allowed us six months later to continue operating remotely, almost as if nothing has changed. Uh, I think to your point about digitization, that was a trend beforehand. I think what changed was the sense of urgency for our clients as well as for ourselves as to how quickly we can we need to get there. And I, I will talk about kind of three aspects of that. One aspect is digitization of their interactions with the banks, account opening, e-signatures, approvals, all of that which everyone wanted to do, but we all found excuses to move towards more slowly, all happened much more quickly. Yeah. The second thing, the second change that happened very quickly is the shift towards a direct to consumer model for a lot of our clients, because nothing focuses minds more than not being able to sell anything because people don't get out of their house and therefore having a way to directly connect with consumers and with marketplaces became a big trend for our consumer clients, our retail clients, et cetera. And then the third one, more on the retail or small business side, is the expansion of the P2P digital payment methods. Once again, that was there, and in some parts of the world, it, it was already dominant. But in places like the United States, the sp speed of change that we saw over the past few months was incredible. Yeah. And then internally within JP Morgan, and I assume uh, for my peers it would be the same story, also internally the pace of change was much faster. Because yeah. typically when we think about you know, making a change and, I don't know, approving Zoom, these kinds of things typically takes us months and we need to try them and roll them out in pilots, et cetera, et cetera. When you have no other option, you do things in days, which otherwise would have taken months. And I think that's one thing that all of us can take away from this. We can maintain our controls and still move faster. Yeah. So it sounds like in, in many ways, JP Morgan was, was able to pivot relatively smoothly 
as, as a function of this. And so I just wonder, as you're looking forward and thinking about the future of finance, how are you preparing for what you expect in the future? And also, because we have many banks here of different sizes and different markets, if you were a bank that had limited investment resources, what types of technologies or capabilities do you think they should be prioritizing now to prepare for the future? Sure. So uh, let me may, maybe take them kind of one at a time. First, I think the future of payments is exciting. I don't think there is any other part of the banking industry that, that's undergoing such a tremendous change. And it's a change towards the future, towards digital, et cetera. So I think the future is quite exciting. And I don't think the end state, the end game has been written yet. So it's up to all of us collectively to define and shape how that's going to look like. So I think it's a great place and a great business to be in. And I'm kind of very excited to be here. Um, then I think when you look at the trends of the industry, I think you need to separate between retail and wholesale. Because in retail, we've seen that aggressive entrant from fintechs, whether it is PayPal and Square and Stripe and Adyen and all of these guys who are really good at customer experience and are trying to push banks into the back end kind of processing while they own the customer experience and the customer interaction. That obviously is something that we need to address if we want to stay in the game and we want to capture a decent portion of the value chain. On the wholesale side, it's a different story. And I think the challenge there is how do you continue to innovate while at the same time maintaining the control environment that we need to have and maintaining all the legacy infrastructure that we all need to maintain. And by the way, we need to do all of that in a zero interest rate environment, at least for a while. So I think there are lots of things to consider there. Thinking about JP Morgan, the answer is we are investing in all of the above. Uh, by customer segment and by industry, we have a big focus on marketplaces and how we can combine merchant acquiring and the payout side, the treasury services side around the concept of wallet. So we can provide an end-to-end -end solution to our e-commerce clients. We have a very clear view on what the architectural design of our technology needs to look like. So when people come with new ideas, we know where these ideas fit. So we don't do things multiple times. And we also always look at, is there a partnership or an acquisition that we could do that would get us there more quickly? Yeah. We are spending a lot of time in thinking how product and tech become one, because our business is a technology business. And what we sell to our clients is our platforms and our connectivity to payment systems around the world. And then finally, we are also investing as part of our R&D efforts in new technologies. Not because we know that these new technologies will be the future, but we think there are interesting learnings there. And we want to be there. We want to learn. And that's why we launched uh, a couple of weeks ago Onyx as the sub-brand of wholesale payments, which is going to house all of these initiatives. So I would say for us, our biggest constraint right now is our imagination, like good ideas on how the future should look like, and obviously the ability to execute on those good ideas in terms of technology and people, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I think yeah. whether you have a lot of constraints or not, I think your product people, and I'm, I'm talking to my peers, will come with a lot of ideas. And you know, it's a lot of good ideas, and it's what they hear from, from clients, et cetera. And all of them individually make sense, but obviously you can't do all of them. I think actually the product ideas are the less important piece. The more important piece, at least in my mind, is to be able to answer three questions. And that does not cost more money. So I don't think it's about spending more. I think it's about spending in a slightly different way and hopefully a little bit smarter. Yeah. I think the first thing you need to consider is, are you building a modern tech ecosystem? Are you leveraging the cloud? Are you API first? Do you develop microservices that are configurable and can be used in multiple use cases? Yeah. The second is, are you able to deliver data and insights both to yourself and your business for risk management and everything else and to your clients who are looking for real-time access to information? In a zero-rate environment, and I know it's a platitude, but data has an incredible amount of value as long as you can provide it in the form of insights to your customers. 
And then the third piece of advice, which I give to my team, so I will, I will share, is just don't look for perfect solutions. Very often people say, we cover all of these customer segments, let me design the right solution for each one and the right map by a customer journey, et cetera, et cetera. And in my view, that looks good in paper, it does not work in practice. What works in practice is come up with a solution, not a product, a solution for a client to a real problem, try it out, get the feedback from clients, roll it out to more clients, learn and keep on expanding. So my yeah. view is that increment, more incremental, more agile approach is going to get us to a better place than big multi-year programs. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I know this month there's, there's almost nothing that we can do, certainly within the context of the United States, without considering policy regulations and the framework <laughs> within which the organizations like yourself operate. And of course, the last time you and I chatted, um, we weren't quite sure the direction of the, the next US government. I think we have a little bit more clarity now. I just wonder what's your perspective and, and what are you anticipating to be sort of the future of the, the policy framework? And how do you think uh, uh, businesses like trade and relationships uh, uh, between parties, multilateral, bilateral, how do you expect that to, to play out going forward? So first of all, I mean, who knows, I wish I knew. But first of all, I'm happy the, the elections are over at last because for the last like, month, everything had kind of shut down waiting for the outcome. So I, I'm glad it's over. Uh, I would say it's obviously, it's too early to tell. We need to see what the new administration is gonna do, et cetera. I, I would say from our business uh, perspective, the most important elements are stability, predictability, and then a level playing field. And there are a lot of issues right now that are uncertain. Whether we look at the US and what's going to happen with tax policy, regulation, et cetera. You look in Europe, you have Brexit. You look around the world, you have tariffs. You have questions around trade agreements, et cetera. So getting that field kind of um, getting clarity around that, I think would be quite beneficial to us being able to make longer term investments. And then the level playing field is also important. You look at banks around the world, have different rules, different capital requirements. You look here in the US between banks and fintechs, the rules are not always the same, even though the kinds of businesses we are in become increasingly similar. So for me, these are the three most important things and I'm hoping that you know, with the new administration, we will be able to get some of that here in the US get some more clarity in Europe with what's going to happen with Brexit and hopefully move to a world, you know, hopefully post COVID in which growth starts again and the whole dialogue becomes less zero sum and more positive. Yeah, and, and in terms of growth, I know one of the things organizations are trying to adapt to is how to drive growth in this environment. Also, when you're limited in how you're able to go and visit clients and do things like that. Have, have you unlocked any secrets or, or thoughts about um, uh, how to achieve growth in, with some of these headwinds? Yeah, I, I, I don't think there are any secrets. My view is that you need to keep the sales intensity. The clients still have a business to run. Yes, that business looks a little bit more, a little bit different, but they also want to continue to operate. They want to continue being profitable. And it's up to us to make their payments more efficient, reduce the cost of their FX charges, reduce the cost of running their business, reduce the cost or the number of accounts and the complexity that they have. So these problems are still there and it's up to us to develop the solutions that are gonna help them. I think the second thing is help clients that are undergoing transformation. And we mentioned digitization, we mentioned the move to consumer. A lot of businesses are really rethinking and changing their business model. In my mind, there is no better time to go and have that conversation with them. And yes, it's going to be over video as opposed to in person, but that doesn't change uh, the power of that dialogue. And we are now, what is it, seven months in the pandemic, right? So this is the world we are in. Hopefully it's going to change at some point, but that's the world we are in. We can't wait and our clients can't wait until this is over. We need to continue to operate. So I would say keep the intensity, keep the communication with the clients, and I yeah. think good things will happen. Good, 
good. So one of the things, just continuing with the uh, some of the themes we've seen through the elections here in the U.S., um, there was certainly a lot of emphasis around um, social elements and the roles that organizations have. Social responsibility has taken on a new meaning. It's not just environmental sustainability, but truly a, a, a social responsibility that organizations have. And we've heard a lot about what different organizations have pledged to do. What's your views and, and how have things sort of shaped your thinking about social responsibility that organizations and banks have going forward? Yeah, so obviously we are part of JP Morgan, so a, a lot of the things that we do are firm-wide. Uh, I think on the ESG front, uh, we've made a couple of announcements around supporting the Paris Climate Accords, making the bank carbon neutral, uh, committing money through our asset management business, et cetera, uh, launching green new products, et cetera. So there is a whole host of initiatives that we have as a bank. Uh, I think from our side, obviously, we continue to support the payment flows associated with that. And in particular, within trade finance, within kind of the supply chain and export finance world, there, there is work that we can do and we are doing around, for example, wind farms and other things like that to support those efforts. Uh, I, I don't know if you want me to also talk as part of that about diversity or... Um, sure, sure. Sure. Because that's another part, I think, of the social responsibility of, uh, of companies. And it's obviously, I mean, to, to state the obvious unfortunate that in the 21st century, we have the issues that we have. And I just want to stress, because many of us run global business uh, businesses, this is not just a U.S.-specific phenomenon. It's right. a global phenomenon, which obviously have different manifestations in different countries and different parts of the world. But the underlying issue is always looking at people differently because of the color of their skin or of their country of origin or of their uh, gender or of their, you know, any other preference. So that is obviously not acceptable. This is not something that we discovered yesterday. But at the same time, uh, there is no silver bullet. I think the good thing is that our business and our industry is among the most diverse within banking. Um, but there is still definitely more work to be done. Um, I don't think there is any silver bullet, but within my business and across JP Morgan, uh, there is a number of things that we are thinking about. Uh, the first one is holding people accountable. So we have a series of metrics, both quantitative and qualitative, which are part of senior management's compensation. So it is one of the important dimensions across uh, which you are judged as a manager. Uh, and then we are looking at the full value chain, starting with how we recruit. Which schools do we go to? What kind of people do we get from there? Are we going to enough schools that have diverse candidates? Then we look at the recruitment process. Diverse slates. Uh, it should be 100%. Uh, we are looking at talented individuals, especially at senior levels that we know across the industry, and we are always proactively talking to them to see when there might be an opportunity to join us. We are looking at promotions. Promotions should be consistent with representation uh, at the you know, lower level. If that's not the case, that means that we are doing something wrong. Maybe it's conscious, maybe it's unconscious. It doesn't really matter. We need to go out of our way to make sure we provide platforms to people. Um, and then we have uh, a senior person in the company called Brian Lamb, who is spearheading that effort across all of our businesses and is helping us share best practices and helping us move forward. Uh, this is not something that obviously can be solved overnight, but what I want to see is continued progress. And I want to see our employees coming to work every day and feeling that they can bring their full selves to work and feel that this is a really inclusive environment. Yeah, excellent. So if, if you were to, to think about perhaps the single most important area for banks across the industry to collaborate, to try to, to come up with solutions to common problems, where would you want us to focus our attention? That's a great question. And I, I would say that bank collaboration is really important. If you think about all of our cost bases, they are so overlapping. We all do very, very similar things. 
and when we are able to create industry utilities, like we did, for example, with real-time payments and with Zelle here in the U.S. and in other areas, all of us see the value. I think, and I mentioned some of the work that BAFT is doing, it's all uh, quite valuable. Uh, within JP Morgan, the approach that we are taking as part of, uh, of the Onyx effort is to think about how we can create platforms uh, so many banks can interact with each other and exchange information with each other in a secure way. And the types of use cases that we are thinking about to answer your question is every area in which there is inefficiency and duplication in the industry. Think of check processing. You issue a check on one side, it has to go through a whole process, post office, physical checks, et cetera, to make it to a lockbox to get processed. This is a very old fashioned, slow and expensive process. There is no reason why large parts of that cannot be digitized. Think of an issue like account validation. All of the banks, when they send money to new beneficiaries, all have the same issue, the same returns, et cetera. As banks, we should be able to pull that information together in a way that protects data privacy uh, and local regulations, but reduce that churn. So where I would focus to your question is every area where there is duplication, every any area where there are information barriers, and look for ways to create that kind of sharing, again, with the appropriate controls, so that we don't all have to do the same things multiple times. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. And I think but, a zero rate environment may help focus all of our minds a little bit more on ways to become more efficient. Right. <laughs> that's that's sort of the word of the day or the word of the year. Um, it, this has been great. I'd like to, um, if you would allow me, maybe just to, to get to know a little bit more about you personally. So I, I'll switch it up and maybe we can finish with a couple of sort of lightning round questions, if you don't mind. So, sure. favorite subject in school? Science, math, English, art? That's easy, it was 100% physics. Physics, wonderful. Um, I didn't become a physicist by accident. <laughs> so, uh, where do you get your news these days? Print publications, TV? I think I'm a little bit old school on that. So I used to read a bunch of newspapers. Now I read the digital versions of those, but same stuff. I, Economist, I, I, FT, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. So it's the same newspapers that I always used to read, except now it's the digital version. At, at least it's not Twitter, right? It's not Twitter and TV right. only during elections. Right. So if you're going to binge watch, is it Netflix or Hulu? Well, unfortunately, my kids have taken over the TV at home, so we mostly binge watch the variety of teenage girl TV shows on Netflix. Ah, <laughs> I, I, I know the feeling. Um, so if you're reading for pleasure, is it fiction or is it nonfiction? Uh, all of the above. I, I like to read history quite a lot. Uh, I do like to read fiction as well. So I would say both. Okay. And texts or phone calls? I, I do both. I think texts are obviously more efficient, but I think during COVID, because you don't see anyone, I think phone calls, video calls are just really, really important. You need to be able to see people. You need to be able to talk to them. And I think the face-to-face -face connection is really important. So much more phone and video nowadays than text. Excellent. Takis, thank you very much. We'd like to send it back to you, Jane. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Takas.